The fighting had been over for a month in Cyprus in September 1974. In Nicosia, families waited for returning prisoners of war. They looked for the familiar face to appear among those of the other men returning from imprisonment in Turkey. If not that, then for a comrade who had seen him and would bring the message that he was well and would arrive with the next batch. My son is 20 years old. He would have been demobilized on the day of the invasion. Now he's missing. My husband looks everywhere to find a sign of his whereabouts. They captured him on the 26th of July at Ayos Yorios near Kyrenia. We have been told nothing up till now. I'm waiting for my son, who has been missing since the 6th of August. He was last seen at Lapithos. Since then, we have had no message. Only recently, on Saturday, someone said he had seen him at Adana in Turkey, but he is not certain. I also have not seen my son since the 6th of August. He was last seen in Lapithos. Since then, we have had no news. My son is also lost. I have had no message at all. I have declared this everywhere I could, but have had no response. I come here every day hoping that among the returning prisoners is someone who can tell me about my child. I hope that my child will come along the same road as the others who are returning. I pray to God that he will help me to experience the joy. <laughs> the prisoners crossed the line which divides Nicosia at the Lidra Palace checkpoint. In July, Cyprus had been the victim of a double attack. First, the dictators of Greece had ordered their officers stationed in Cyprus to depose the constitutional government rather than leave as they were ordered to do by the president of Cyprus, Archbishop Makarios. Five days later, Turkish troops landed on the island under the pretense that they had come to restore legality. Greek Cypriots did not believe this and fought with primitive weapons against Turkey's fully equipped army. They were killed and taken prisoner. On July 30th in Geneva, the foreign ministers of Greece, Turkey and Britain, guarantors of the independence of Cyprus, called for an exchange of prisoners. There was no exchange. Two weeks later, rather, Turkey struck again, expanding its initial beachhead to an occupation of 40% of Cyprus. Faced with massive armor and air force, the Greek Cypriot National Guard was helpless. Hundreds were caught behind the Turkish lines, and thousands of civilians had no time to flee the advancing army of occupation. Many were arrested by the Turkish troops. At a meeting of acting president Kleridis and the Turkish Cypriot leader, Mr. Denktash, there was agreement on an exchange of prisoners. So the families waited. They knew from the newspapers that many of the prisoners had been removed to jails in Turkey. The International Committee of the Red Cross had made every effort, but few had received a message from the prisoner of war camps. The exchange was conducted under the auspices of the United Nations Force in Cyprus at the Lidra Palace checkpoint. But they did not reunite with their relatives there. They were transported in buses to the Cyprus government reception center at the hotel and catering institute on the other side of Nicosia. Hundreds were waiting to see whether their husband, son or brother was among them. They came from villages all over unoccupied Cyprus. Many had come from the refugee camps. For months they had lived for this minute 
hoping that it would be the time of reunion. For some, the ordeal was over. They were back, the first ones to return from Turkish captivity. They had had their hands tied behind their backs. They were blindfolded. Hungry and thirsty in the midsummer Mediterranean heat, they had been packed in scorching lorries and then boats and were transported to mainland Turkey. They had seen friends killed in battle and others executed because they had been injured and could not walk to captivity. They had been uncertain whether they themselves would return alive, like this man just returned from a Turkish jail. <laughs> I was taken prisoner after a battle between the villages Sihari and Belabais. There were two artillery units there, and we started back to Nicosia. On the way, the Turks attacked us. We were forced to fight to save our lives at least. The fighting lasted about three hours. Then they came close and took about 40 prisoners. The injured prisoners were executed. They put the injured on the left-hand side of the road and ordered us to lie on the right hand and we heard machine gun fire and then we saw the bodies. What I mean is that those of us who could walk, they took with them. Those who could not, they killed. <laughs> But now it was over. Their experiences took their place as nightmares that were ended. They were given simple things an inoculation, the opportunity to wash and shave, clean clothes, food. But mainly, they were given the feeling that they were once more among people who cared whether they lived or died. Between the 16th of September 1974 and the 31st of October, 2,477 Greek Cypriots were released from captivity. Then the exchange of prisoners stopped. But the men and women in black were still looking. The passport photograph had become the link of hope to those that had not returned. They hoped that one of the released would identify them from a photograph and say that they had seen them and that they were well in one of the Turkish jails. It could be that their hope was based on no more than the inability to accept that the man whom they were waiting for would never return. But they knew one thing, that many of those that they were waiting for were seen alive and well after all fighting had ceased. Many had been arrested after the final ceasefire behind the Turkish lines. For some, it was too much. The exchange had ceased and the missing member of their family had not returned. They had kept him. No one knew why. They despaired as the flesh and blood man that they were waiting for became one of those whose fate is unknown. Photographs, the most concrete representation of those whose fate is unknown. They are the missing persons. According to the International Committee of the Red Cross, a missing person is any person for whom an inquiry has been opened 
and for whom no information has been obtained permitting the establishment of his existence or his death two thousand one hundred and ninety seven people are missing according to the red cross records for an island the size of cyprus they are a lot the equivalent figure in the united states would be one million nine hundred and two of the missing are civilians of whom 152 are women. Almost 600 are between the ages of 40 and 60. 29 are children under the age of 16. This is the beginning of the search for the missing. The first evidence came from those who returned. These people had not disappeared during battle, they insisted. They had been arrested by Turkish forces. I was a prisoner of war for three and a half months in Turkey. During the time when I was in Turkey, I was with three fellow villagers, whom I know well, who were together until the day I was released. We were together even in the buses when they were taking us to the Lidra Palace to release us. But they took the others off the buses on the way and did not release them. These three are the son of Papalos, Minas, and the son of Christodoulos from Coikino Tremithia. Till today, they are missing. On the 21st of August, 1974, in Asia, and I am from Asia, the Turks from Turkey came and took us out of our houses to gather us together. On the way, while walking, I saw two Turkish military vehicles. On them were 30 or 35 civilians with their hands tied behind their backs. I know them all well since we are from the same village and until today they are all missing. The Turks entered Russia on the 14th of August 1974. I was in the village until the 21st of August. On the 21st of August, about 10 o'clock in the morning, Turkish soldiers, helped by the Turkish Cypriots Kamil Yakub and Ahmed Arif, forced us out of our houses and collected us in the village square. There, they separated women, children and the old ones in one side and the rest of us in the other side. I, together with 107 others, was tied up. They left us in the village square for two hours. Then. They loaded us into three lorries and took us to Ayakibir village. Left us there for about two hours and then took us away. At the time when they were taking us away, there were among us Theodulos Solomi from Afanya, who used to be a rural constable. A Turkish Cypriot who came from the same village as Theodulos took him down from the lorry. Theodulos Solomi is missing until today. From Ayat Kepir, they brought us to Nicosia, to Pavlidis garage. There, the Turkish Cypriot officer Ali Riza climbed upon the car with the two Turkish soldiers, searched the younger ones, and ordered us to come down from the lorry. Those of us who stayed at Pavlidis garage counted ourselves, and we were 37. About 70 people must have remained on the lorries. Since when we counted ourselves at Ayakepir, there were 107 of us. I heard the Turkish officer give an order to return the 70 who remained on the car to Asha. We remained in prison in Pavlidis garage until the 11th of September 1974. Then they took us to Turkey and released us on the 20th of October 1974. When I returned to Cyprus, I heard that my 70 fellow villagers who remained on the lorries had not been seen since. The village of Asha is one of many where enclaved Greek Cypriots were arrested by Turkish forces after the fighting stopped. Asha had not been the scene of fighting during the coup or during the Turkish invasion. It had been taken without resistance on the first day of the second Turkish offensive on the 14th of August 1974. Seven days later, on the 21st of August, 70 inhabitants of the village had been taken away in lorries by Turkish troops. Evidence like this is important. 
the Turkish authorities argue that there are no missing persons, that those who have not returned to their homes were killed during the coup or during the Greek Cypriot resistance to what Turkish governments like to call the peacekeeping operation. There is no need, they argue, for international agencies to search for missing Greek Cypriots. But in Asher, there was no fighting. That is why the Cyprus government and the relatives of those who are missing began a systematic collection of evidence. A file was opened for each of the missing, lists of their names, photographs, anything which could shed some light on the fate of these people. After all, some of them had been heard identifying themselves and speaking from the Turkish Cypriot radio station in the very first days of fighting to inform their families that they were being well treated. This was surely evidence that they were alive and in custody. With time, there was more evidence, photographic evidence, for example. More than 70 Greek Cypriots who were on the missing list were identified in photographs of Greek Cypriot prisoners which appeared in the press, mainly in Turkish and Turkish Cypriot newspapers and journals. These photographs show that many Greek Cypriots who are still missing were not killed in action, much less during the coup, but were alive in the hands of the Turkish authorities after hostilities had ceased. In this photograph, which appeared in the Turkish Cypriot Special News Bulletin on the 14th of September 1974, three people who are still missing were identified. The caption under the photograph read in part, Greek Cypriot prisoners of war during their lunch hour. Another two missing persons were identified in this photograph. It is a scene from a Nicosia prison camp and was released by the Turkish Cypriot News Information Service on the 5th of September, 1974. The next two photographs appeared in the Turkish journal Hayat on the 19th of September, 1974. It shows a group of Greek Cypriot prisoners at Snake Island Beach on the Kyrenia coast on their way to being transported to Adana in Turkey. In this photograph, individuals who are still missing are undoubtedly in custody. A second photograph of Greek Cypriot prisoners, where six persons now missing clearly appear, was published in the same issue. In this photograph, ten missing persons have been recognized by their relatives. This film was confiscated by the Greek Cypriot National Guard from a Turkish war correspondent who lost his way and entered Greek Cypriot positions. It contains a sequence of photographs of the second round of the Turkish invasion, during which Moving out in both directions from the nicosia kyrenia corridor, the Turkish forces cut the island in two. The sequence of still photographs shows the Turkish army in action as photographed by a friendly observer. On the film, there is a sequence of photographs recording the capture of five Greek Cypriots. The first photographs are apparently taken from the tank on which the Turkish war correspondent Ertun Konukshever was sitting. In subsequent photographs, the Greek Cypriots, clearly seen in a position of surrender, are approached, their belongings are removed, and one is offered a cigarette by a non-commissioned officer, Corporal Mustafa of tank crew Merig 1 from Samsun. The five National Guardsmen are Andonagis Korellis, age 30, from Githrea, Anikos Nikolaou, age 26, from Exometochi, Christophoros Kordis, age 25, from Dali, Ioannis Papayannis, age 24, from Neonchorion, and Filipos Hadjigiriakos, age 19, from Famagusta. The five National Guardsmen were taken into the custody of the Turkish army 
in the presence of a non-commissioned officer and of a Turkish journalist. Yet their names do not appear on the list of prisoners given by the Turkish authorities to the International Committee of the Red Cross, and they have not returned. There is documentary evidence also showing that not all prisoners were returned by the Turkish authorities. On the 24th of September, they gave a list of 2,115 names of prisoners of war in their custody to the International Committee of the Red Cross. Even of the people whose names were on this list, seven are still missing. The young man referred to in this Red Cross document was arrested after the end of fighting on the 17th of August near Famagusta with five others who have since been released. While in captivity at the Sarai police station in Turkish-occupied Nicosia, he was visited by a Red Cross delegate who made this attestation that he had seen and identified him. Now he is on the missing list. With the second advance of the Turkish forces, thousands of Greek Cypriot civilians were cut off and enclaved behind the Turkish lines. The Red Cross immediately made lists of all such people. These names were those listed as inhabitants of Mandres village on the 27th of August, two weeks after the end of hostilities. Those whose names are underlined are now missing. Their fellow villagers say that they were arrested on the 1st of September, 1974. In conformity with an agreement for the exchange of students who were enclaved or prisoners, the Turkish authorities prepared a list of Greek Cypriot students who were in the area under their control. 138 people were listed. Six of them were never released. The Red Cross has prepared a report on each one. Take Nikos Kologodronis, for example. He was captured by Turkish troops together with Kostagis Katirchis on the 11th of September, almost a month after the end of hostilities. Kostagis was released, but Nikos is still missing. The relatives of those who are missing still wait two years later. They demonstrate, they address themselves to embassies and to the United Nations. When the intercommunal talk started on Cyprus, there was new hope. An ad hoc committee for missing persons met in nine sessions until June 1975 with no result. In November 1975, the issue of the missing Cypriots was discussed in the Human Rights Commission of the United Nations, which referred the issue to the Assembly. In December, a General Assembly resolution with 106 votes in favor, none against, and 26 abstentions, expressed grave concern, recognized the basic human need of the families of the missing to be informed of their fate, and requested the Secretary-General to exert every effort at tracing them. At the fifth round of the intercommunal talks, the issue of the missing persons was raised in the presence of the Secretary-General of the United Nations. The Turkish side promised to help, but has always turned down proposals for setting up joint procedures for locating both Greek and Turkish Cypriot missing persons. So the relatives are still waiting. It's hard to know where to go for help, for information, even for a citizen of the United States. These are my husband's old passports, the new passport he was carrying with him. We had the flag of the United States on our house. The Turks came on the 14th of August, but did not molest us. 
On the 21st, they took us all out of our house together. They searched us, and then they took us up to the village square. There, they separated the men, took them, put them in buses, and took them away. We did not know where they were taking them. I have a daughter who is about to be married, and I don't have the means which are necessary. I have another two children who go to secondary school. I have difficulties because it is all my responsibility. What can I do, a woman alone with seven children, whom I must look after? I'm sick from the worry and cannot work properly. We look everywhere to find some news of my husband, but no one gives us a reply. I ask for help from anyone who can help us to find anything at all about him. Έτσι ζητούμε τη βοήθεια εμεί που κάποιου άλλου που μπορούν να μα βοηθήσουν τίποτα να ακούσουμε κάτι τα λόγω του. Ενώ τίποτα, καμιά απάντηση. Επιάσαν από το σπίτι μα πέντε δικού μα. Τον άντρα μου, πέντε χρονών. Το γιο μου. They took away five people from our house. My husband, who is 50 years old. My elder son, who is 23. He's a student at Moscow, and he came back for the vacations. My other son, Yanaki, who is 18 years, Andonakis, who is 16, and my son-in-law, who is 26. When the Turks entered our house, it was about 1.30 p.m. I don't know why they fired in there, and a cousin of mine was injured. When we all went out, they asked us about various things. A bus came up, but we could not all get in, and they took only the men. They put us, the women, in another car. A family from Githrea was with us. Their son was 15, and the father was 35. Also, two cousins of mine, one of 12, another of 14. The one who is 14 was injured. We don't know whether they took him to a doctor. Then they took us, the women, to Mora, and set us free after four days. We know nothing about the men of our family up to now. They were arrested two days after the war ended. They were well in the house with us until then. But we do not know what they have done to them since then. Nine of us are now living at Chakileri near Aradipu. My father, my husband, my sister's husband are missing, and we are alone. When the Turkish forces enter our village at the 14th of August, the Turks did not come to our house. After two days, on the 16th, without there being any fighting or any resistance, they came to our house and took our men away. They took my father and my husband, also the husband of my cousin and their son. They put them in a car and went away. These three women are typical of hundreds. Some of them have seen their husbands arrested with their own eyes. Now they struggle to bring up their children alone and hope. This girl remains two years later faithful to her fiancé. I shall wait for my fiancé because I know that he's alive and that he was taken prisoner by the Turks after the invasion. I do not think that they harmed him because he was so quiet. I bought his clothes with me because I know he will come back 
I saw him be taken away, and I believe that he's alive. Every day I make sure his clothes are ready. I believe that he's alive because they did not take him in battle. I know he's alive, and I will wait for him no matter how long. She can't believe that anyone would harm him. She still looks after his clothes. Some people with a member of the family missing add an extra place at table. Nothing has happened to persuade them that the person missing from their house is dead. They feel that these people, alive when hostilities ceased, should still be alive. But at least they want to know. Loss is something one can get used to. But loss accompanied by uncertainty is suffered every day anew. I have two children, a daughter of Yi, who is now five, and a boy who is almost three. The smaller child was one at the time when we left the village. He could not walk. We suffered a lot because we left our house with virtually nothing. But now, little by little, we have done something. We can survive. But our house is not suitable, especially for the children. My daughter has bronchitis, and especially in winter, with the house having no doors or windows, it is very difficult. I have to take her to the doctor almost twice a week. But the most difficult problem is that their father is missing. Almost every day, or rather every hour, I should say, they ask me where their father is and when he will come back. I did not tell them the truth, that he's one of those who are missing, because I don't know whether he's alive or dead. I tell them that he's in England and will come back. My children live with the illusion that sometime their father will return. When letters come from my brothers who are abroad, my daughter asks, why do we get no letters from my father? I don't know what to answer. I say, he will come back someday, dear. It does not matter that he does not write. Sometime he will come. My son also asks all the time. Imagine, every night they take his photograph, kiss it, and then they go to sleep. At least they have a right to know.